I'm to, uh, going to talk today about a meta-analysis of the comparison question polygraph test. Um, the article is, is, uh, has been mentioned as published in the special issue of Applied Cognitive Psych, and the uh, QR code down here in the corner um, should take you there to download it. It's open source, so please, please do that. Um, the picture, uh, I'm in Boise, Idaho. Uh, this is a picture of a small river that's about 50 kilometers from where I'm speaking from now. So just to give you a little idea of what uh, this part of the world looks like. Um, there we go. Now, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about polygraph tests and about the comparison question test. Um, the, the comparison question test is in use worldwide. Um, it's a psychophysiological test that uses physiological measures to directly assess for credibility. It's used in forensics, national security, uh, employment in at least 65 countries. There are 24 uh, recognized training schools and um, worldwide there are 12 professional organizations with uh, international memberships. And there are at least three journals now that focus on research in this particular area. Um, there are a number of re reviews available in the literature. There has been one every you know, six or seven years for quite some time now, um, but, very, but no meta-analyses. Um, one of the first really well-known reviews was the Office of Technology Assessment in 83, and then there was an exchange between uh, the Utah group and the Minnesota group in 1997. Uh, the uh, U.S. National Research Council published a book, a uh, large review in 2003, and then Icono and Ben Shakar published a review in Law and Human Behavior uh, in 2018. There are problems with all of those reviews, including the one that I was co-author on, in that they're all selective. None of them were comprehensive. Uh, they, they chose studies and and left other studies out, sometimes with more or less clarity about why they did that. Um, uh, they provided no sensitive quantitative analyses, so there were no meta-analytic estimates. Um, interpretation was often subjective. Um, the NRC came up with a high estimate of validity, but they felt that the research methods were substandard and they should not be believed. Um, I, I thought that was a peculiar finding at the time uh, because most of the studies that they decided not to believe had been peer reviewed. And so apparently the NRC people thought they knew more than the editors and the peer review viewers of good journals like applied, uh, applied psychology and psychophysiology and so on. Their conclusions were judgments. They weren't scientific findings. Uh, there, there was one very small meta-analysis in 1988, um, which if you go, meta-analysis is not that old a statistical technique, and really the techniques were available in 1988 were pretty primitive compared to what we have now. Uh, that one included only 14 laboratory studies. They came up with a detection efficiency coefficient which as, a, as a measure. Uh, of effect size of 0.66, um, and they found some moderator effects of sample motivation and scoring method, but there was a very high level of collinearity between those three moderators. That is, they were highly correlated with each other, and so uh, they're confounded in that regard, and it's, um, it was very hard to try to separate out what effects were there and, and so on. So, and I'll give a shout out here uh, that my co-authors were shown on the first page, but I want to give a shout out to, to inspiration here. Uh, my inspiration for doing this study was Hartwig and Bond and their um, uh, meta-analysis of the interpersonal detection of deception literature. And Marie Hartwig and Charles Bond were really helpful to me uh, when I began working on this uh, with advice about how to select possible moderators and just how to proceed with coding and 
all of those issues that are involved in conducting a meta-analysis. And in my discussions with them and, and um, my thinking on this area, and I, I've been working on this area since the late 1970s. Uh, so it's, it's an area I've thought about a lot. Um, and we decided to use an extremely open-ended criteria for inclusion of studies in the meta-analysis. Um, we wanted to take in as many studies as possible, and, and our primary goal was to avoid any suggestion that we'd somehow selected studies to bias the analysis. So we wanted to take everything we possibly could. Um, we wanted to look at uh, studies that address the validity of the comparison question test and included at least one of the standard physiological measures. So the three standard measures are respiration, electrodermal activity, and a measure of relative blood pressure. So we wanted at least one of those. Uh, there was sufficient information included in the study to calculate true and false positive rates, true and false negative rates, and inconclusive rates if they were allowed. One of the things that complicates the analysis of the comparison question test is that there are not, is not, there are three outcomes possible, not just two. So you could be found to be credible, you could found to be not credible, or we could say, mm, we can't tell. And so from my point of view, anything that looks at the validity of the comparison question test needs to take into account that three level outcome. Uh, which makes the analysis rather more complicated. We, we did uh, the publication documents, uh, the search terms and so on. I won't go into that, but we eventually examined 173 documents, 112 of them met our selection criteria and were coded. Uh, there were 61, obviously, then that didn't. Uh, all of that's described in the manuscript. Um, from the 112 documents, we coded 221 data sets with 16,278 decisions. However, a number of those data sets were reliability data. So as we have different people scoring exactly the same data with the, exactly the same scoring system. So we, we narrowed those down and, and did not include reliability data in the meta-analysis. Ultimately, we analyzed 138 data sets that were independent analyses. There were no cases of the same data being scored more than once by the same system. Those 138 data sets had 11,474 decisions. 42% of the data sets were reported after the most recent review, that is the National Research Council review in 2008. So, um, there were 49 data sets from field settings and 27 of those were reported after the NRC. It's interesting because Icono and Ben Shikar, one of their conclusions was that nothing had been done since the NRC. Um, and by our view, uh, roughly half of the scientific literature had been generated since the NRC. So it looks like there was a lot done. We coded a number of moderator variables. Uh, there's a long controversy in this scientific literature about, about conducting experiments versus data from the field. So we coded that. We looked at scoring systems. The polygraph field is um, uh, fragmented in the way things are scored. Um, we actually coded eight, but only two of those had enough data for meaningful analysis which is a, a system that was used by the US federal government, which is uh, the most widely used system in the world. And there's also the system that was developed at the University of Utah, which is completely uh, based upon empirical analysis and how it was developed. We looked at single versus multiple issues. Does the credibility test address a single issue? Does it address multiple issues? Uh, there are two, kinds of comparison question tests, probable lie versus directed lie. I don't have time to tell you what those differences are. The directed lie is the newer and it's much more standardized. Um, if you're interested, get in touch with me. I'll be glad to send you uh, literature on that. We looked at studies that were peer reviewed and published in peer reviewed journals versus not peer reviewed. Um, we looked at subject source, so students, um, community work and criminal justice. Again, there's a lot of controversy in this literature about using uh, university students as your um, 
uh, database. And we looked at motivation. Um, and ultimately, we ended up coding three levels for motivation. That is nothing. So there's nothing associated with the outcome of the test. Uh, there's something uh, in a lot of the uh, experiments that that's money. Um, and then in the field studies, obviously, there are real world consequences. People lose jobs, may lose their freedom. In some places, they might even be risking losing their life. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on this, and I will say that uh, Stephen Thurber, my co-author, is the meta-analyst, uh, not me. Um, I, I am, I think, an intelligent viewer, uh, but not uh, into the mechanics of this. But um, what Dr. Thurber tells me is that this is the kind of graph you want to see because the data are uh, sort of evenly balanced above and below and you have a relatively normal looking distribution uh, of the studies in the study. Um, I'm only gonna talk about, we looked at uh, true positives and false positives, true negatives and false negatives. And we uh, also looked at area under the curve, um, but I chose to, we chose to focus on, on this statistic, the detection efficiency coefficient, because it incorporates inconclusives. And so you're looking at effect size, looking at inconclusives, uh, outcomes are coded, a, a, a not credible outcome was coded minus one, an inconclusive outco outcome was coded a zero, a credible outcome was uh, coded as a plus one. So inconclusives lower your effect size estimate, but not as much as an error. And um, ultimately we retained that um, and we came up with an effect size, and you can think about that effect size as, as a point by serial correlation. So if you want to think about the scaling of it, that's a good way to think about it, of 0.694. Um, we ran some statistics. Uh, I understand that those statistics are, have sort of fallen out of favor, but we looked at the number of studies uh, looking for a file drawer problem and the estimates of the likelihood of a file drawer problem are negligible. So it would, would require 6,082 studies to exist that have P less than 0.05. Uh, we also converted, you can take the point by serial correlation that we have here and convert that to Cohen's D and the conversion is 1.92 and the um, AUC here would be 0.91. So we came up with an AUC that's very close to what the National Research Council found. They found 0.89, except that our results include inconclusives and theirs didn't. So actually our results suggest a much stronger effect than what um, the National Research Council reported. Um, here's a plot of what the respective distributions would theoretically look like with a Cohen's D of 1.92. And you can see that the two distributions, although they overlap, there's a lot of separation. Uh, I, I again, if you're interested in, uh, in, in those statistics are important, I'd be happy to chat with you about them. Um, we looked at moderators. Uh, we did find in our initial analysis, we concluded all of the data uh, and looked for moderator effects, and we found moderator effects. Um, and if you, um, the important column here is the Q column. So that's the effect, uh, the size of the effect for the various moderators. And you'll notice that although statistically significant, the only one that has uh, um, a lot of power to it and indicated that it was a uh, stronger effect was motivation. Um, in discussing this and through the review process, and I'm going to give a shout out to Chris Meissner as editor of the special edition. Um, Chris Meissner was what an editor should be. He, he made this work much better. He, he had great suggestions for how to improve the work. And uh, it was, I have to say, after publishing 140 studies over my career, uh, my experience with Chris as an editor was probably the best experience I've ever had with an editor. So uh, kudos to Chris. But one of the things that Chris suggested was we also have a lot of collinearity uh, between, uh, between our moderators. Uh, 
And in fact, uh, he suggested we should analyze the field data separately from the laboratory data. And, uh, and we did that. It's just, I've already said this. Um, and after we did that, interestingly, all the moderator effects in the experimental data went away. And so essentially we've replicated um, Hartwig and Bond here with the CQT in that none of these uh, variables seem to matter. Uh, that's particularly interesting to me in that uh, we were all surprised if you look at motivation and some versus none, uh, we've always argued uh, that as the people doing research uh, in, in the area that it's important to have motivation in these studies. This says that, that the, the CQT seems to work even with no motivation. Um, and then we also looked at the field studies. One of the primary findings that we had out of this is that the field studies here are mono method. There really is very little variability between the field studies and the way that they're done. They typically are law enforcement they typically involve using confessions as a criterion. Um, they are fairly monomethod in the techniques that are used. Um, there's just not much to see here. That's interesting, but it's also problematic in that um, it, it, there is variability. There's actually a fairly high amount of variability in outcomes. And so far, we weren't able to capture what the cause of that is. So there's work that needs to be done here. And the area is crying out for new methods to be used. Uh, and particularly interesting, I think, is the criterion method that was developed by Avital Gantone in Israel. That's a mathematical method for uh, deriving accuracy that doesn't involve confessions. Uh, there are only two studies that have been published with that, so we, we can't include that as a moderator, but um, it's a really interesting approach, and I think it deserves um, uh, a lot more interest. This graph, I think, is one of the other major takeaways from this. I, I used Gary Wells' information gain analysis. If you're not familiar with that, I highly recommend that you, you go look up Wells and Olson. I don't remember the year, it's in the 80s, as I recall. Um, Gary Wells told me that he thinks this is the most important work he ever did, uh, which I think is really interesting. But what information gained uh, gives you, uh, these curves show uh, how much gain there is in information from running the test as compared to predicting the base rate. So the x-axis in these three panels is base rate. So uh, base rate of guilt from 1% to 99%. And the curves then show how much gain there is. And the red curves are for deceptive or not credible outcomes. The green curves are for um, credible outcomes. And then the black curve is information of truthfulness from an inconclusive. And what I wanted to do here was to, to get it I'm an applied psychologist. I'm interested about taking this into the real world. What impact did this moderator of motivation have on outcomes in the real world? And so I, we looked at the three levels of motivation that we coded. So the panel on the left is no motivation. Uh, the panel in the middle is some motivation. So these two are uh, experimental panels. And then there's the real world studies. And to me, there's not much difference between these. Uh, interestingly, the out, uh, information gain peak for um, field studies with not credible and field studies with credible, the peaks are about the same. And that suggests that over the last uh, number of years, uh, we, we, and I can say this for a fact, that we've seen a change. The polygraph techniques have been modified to account for the earlier literature showed a preponderance of false positive errors, and the current literature does not show that. What the current literature does show that's different, and the one, the one clearly visible difference between the field and the lab, laboratory studies experiments 
uh, is that there are more inconclusives in the field and those inconclusive outcomes tend to occur with people who are credible. So the changes that have been made have shifted false positive outcomes to inconclusive outcomes, but inconclusive outcomes shouldn't hurt the individual. It's just they don't get the benefit of having passed. So primary takeaways. Uh, for scientists, the meta-analysis provides clear and unambiguous evidence for the ability of the CQT to discriminate truthful from deceptive individuals. The broad theoretical attacks of the critics of the CQT simply don't find any support in the data. For practitioners, this says that the CQT can be useful in showing a large improvement over interpersonal ability to detect deception with CQT showing, and if you convert our, our effect sizes into accuracies, it's in the mid 80s, 80 to 85%. Interpersonal deception detection, as you know from Bella DePaulo and, and the work of many people, Alder Dry, uh, is around 56%. So if you can get into the low 80s, that's a lot of information gain. I will conclude though, there is high variability in this literature. And, and certainly I would never say, and, and, my, and I agree and know my co-authors agree, this doesn't say that every CQT conducted is accurate. It's only that it can be accurate when they're properly conducted. And one of the big problems in this area is standardization and, and regulation. Um, unfortunately, the history of polygraph has a fascinating history that goes all the way back uh, to some of the very famous psychologists in Europe at the turn of the 20th century. Um, uh, Munsterberg wrote, extensively about uh, using physiological measures to detect deception around 1911 or 12. There's a whole chapter in On the Witness Stand. Uh, he foresaw, amazingly foresaw, many of the problems that would come up with this. But unfortunately, this grew as a profession, and it's a profession of practitioners, not scientists. The scientific work, as I've already mentioned, is relatively new. And this is clearly a psychological test. In my opinion, psychology should own it and, and regulate it. Um, I, I honestly don't expect that to happen, but that's my opinion. So uh, here's a picture uh, taken in Boise. I live about a kilometer from where this picture was taken. If you want to get in touch with me, this QR code will, will uh, have my email on it. And I'm, I'll be happy to take questions.